Welcome to Lunch with California Common Cause, our weekly opportunity to chat with our members and others interested in building a better, more inclusive California democracy. I'm Jonathan Metastein, the Executive Director at California Common Cause. I hope everyone's doing okay, hanging in there for the home stretch of election season. I know it's been a lot, six days from now, it's over, or maybe it's just beginning, we're not really sure. Uh, we have an amazing show for you today. Instead of one guest to talk about what's going on in the democracy space in California, we have three guests, three incredible guests, members of our staff who are executing the largest election protection program we have ever run. We live in uncertain and unprecedented times for voting rights. According to the Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project, more than 300 lawsuits have been filed in 44 states about voting rights and the administration of California's, sorry, about America's elections. Those lawsuits touch on every single topic under the voting rights sign, from access to vote by mail, to the availability of ballot drop boxes, to curbside voting, to signature mismatch on vote by mail ballot envelopes, and on and on and on. Several of those cases are already pending before the Supreme Court, and you can count on more going to the Supreme Court um, before and after election day. That Supreme Court, as of this week, has a new justice, Justice Barrett, who is likely to preside over post-election disputes over election administration and accounting of ballots. But the barriers and voter suppression laws that those lawsuits seek to address are just one of several fronts in the fight for a free and fair access to the ballot. Simultaneously, voters must navigate massive disinformation in 2020, coming out of a variety of sources, and unfortunately, first and foremost, the White House, where for months, the message has been that vote by mail can't be trusted and that counting ballots after election day is a sign of malfeasance and fraud. And actually, it's the opposite. It's a sign that elections officials are doing everything they can to count every eligible vote. A long vote count in most cases is a feature, not a bug, in a healthy democracy. And then lastly, voters must also navigate the situation on the ground if they go vote in person. There are already long lines across the United States. There's the virus. There are problems in language and disability access. There are poll workers who don't follow the law. There's the possibility of self-deputized election vigilantes who seek to police or intimidate voters. As an example, just this past weekend, one of our fabulous staff members you're gonna meet in just a moment, stopped by an early voting site in LA County and found six police cars parked at the entrance. We were able to call the county and the squad cars were moved within minutes, but how many quote unquote small situations like that will go unaddressed across the country and make voting harder? But it's not all negative. People are voting in massive numbers. 74 million Americans have already cast their ballots, including 8 million Californians. Both those figures, both the national figure and the California figure, mean that over half of all ballots cast in 2016 in the general, general election have already been cast in the 2020 general election. So we are way ahead of schedule. It remains to be seen whether this enormous wave of early voting, which is setting records in many states, is the beginning of massive turnout in the 2020 general election, or simply uh, a shift away from early voting to early voting, because voters already have their minds made up in this presidential race, and they don't feel voting in person on election day is safe. So um, while challenges to voters remain, uh, we are going to do everything we can at California Common Cause to help them navigate those challenges and to make sure that barriers don't impede people's vote. I wanna bring on our team. Please join me in welcoming program manager, Kiana Asamanfar, consultant, Sean McMorris, and intern, Alexandra Silva. These incredible folks are leading our election protection team, which will have 500 to 600 volunteers in the field protecting the vote on Saturday, Monday, and Tuesday in five counties across Southern California, LA, Orange, San Diego, Riverside, and San Bernardino. Hi, folks. Hi. Hi. Hello. So thank you for everything you're doing. We're going to talk pretty extensively about our election protection program. Um, uh, our volunteers in the field are meant to provide voters with assistance to identify voter intimidation or harassment, to spot language access or disability access problems, and to report issues to Common Cause headquarters, where we're going to elevate and solve problems. Uh, but I want to start here with a really basic question. Kiana, let's start with you. Why do we do this? Why do we do the election protection work um, that takes so much time and so much effort every election cycle? 
Yeah, so for Common Cause, our focus year round is making voting more accessible, improving the voter experience. And so one, once um, election season kind of rolls around, we launch our election protection program to have our eyes and ears on the ground to see what's going on, um, look out for any issues. And really this program is like our last line of defense when it comes to voting. We have people on the ground who are observing, people receiving their ballots, people casting their ballots. We're there to support them if they have any questions or have any issues. And um, if issues do pop up, uh, our volunteers are trained to report those issues to the command center where the Common Cause staff is based. And from there, we have direct lines to each of the counties that we're covering to report issues that pop up in real time and be sure that they're addressed quickly. Um, some examples, Jonathan, you just shared one example that we encountered earlier um, the, uh, last weekend. Um, issues, you encountered specifically. Yes. <laughs> um, in past cycles, it's been a range of issues that pop up. It could be long lines um, that our volunteers observe that we then report to counties to get them to send additional staff or materials. Um, it could be a location that ran out of ballots on election night and we need the county to send additional ballots to help serve all the voters who are waiting in line. Um, it could be other things like language materials, we ask our volunteers to check for translated election material. And if they're not out and displayed, um, we ask the poll worker to display them so that voters are clear um, about what support is available to them. So we're looking for a number of things. We, we work to troubleshoot issues in real time. And we also look to collect data and observations from our volunteers that informs our work in non-election years. So Kiana, it sounds like the underlying purpose of the program is protecting and assisting voters. Right. But you, yeah, right. Um, and and the, I think people might be surprised that California voters need assisting and protecting because the voter suppression stories they hear are in Georgia, Florida, Texas, Ohio, et cetera, et cetera. And the reality is, and, and between the four of us, we've run tons of poll monitoring cycles in California. There are hundreds of problems that occur. Not all of them are intentional disenfranchisement by some sort of evildoer but they are absolutely barriers to access to the vote. Um, so how does the process start? If we're building an election protection program, um, where do we start, Sean? Yeah, so this our election protection program actually starts uh, months in advance. Uh, there's a lot of prep work uh, leading up to early voting and obviously election day. And that prep work uh, starts, uh, you know, begin first we we coordinate and work with our national common cause team uh, on various issues. So for example, this year, other than just having uh, poll monitors, we also incorporated into our program, social media monitors and get out the vote text bankers. So um, that was a lot of work that we had to prepare uh, ahead of time with our national team. Everyone get on the same page and talk about how we're gonna do recruiting. One once that's done, we also reach out to our local uh, partners. And by local, I mean within Southern California and Northern California, uh, we speak with them. Uh, so for example, some of our partners are Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Asian Law Caucus, uh, uh, Disability Rights California, uh, various law schools at uh, Cal State and University uh, California. We reach out to all of those folks, let them know, look, we're getting ready to start the program again. A lot of them have worked with us in the past. Uh, and we start coordinating and talking, uh, deciding how we're going to do things together, where uh, some people that um, come to us, we may move, uh, ask them to go uh, and work with one of our partners because they're in an area uh, where they are. So all that starts. And then the main place that we, we, we get most of our recruits for all of our election protection program is a website that Common Cause has, that, which is www.protectthevote.net. Uh, and that's where people go to sign up and they let us know what program they wanna be in, whether poll monitor, social media monitor, or text banking, uh, and where they live within the state so that we can coordinate all of that. All that gets uploaded into the system. We coordinate again with national, and then we, we, we begin the sorting and emailing of all those people. And they also have to go through training. So we have to prepare trainings uh, which all of our volunteers must do. Uh, and uh, kind of, we've just started finishing up all of that and actually doling out the assignments to all of our volunteers. So that's that's kind of uh, the process and it begins two or three months in advance. 
Alex, I want to bring you in. There's an enormous amount that our volunteers need to know about California election law and how different counties handle the specifics of election administration. In California, we devolve administration of elections to the county level, which means that we're kind of running 58 different elections in California's 58 different counties. So there's an awful lot we need our monitors to know because, boy, oh boy, the worst possible situation is one of our volunteers is in the field not really knowing what they're doing and they make things worse instead of better. So can you tell us about how we train our volunteers? Yeah, absolutely. So this year we've seen a massive amount of volunteers join our program. And with that comes a massive amount of preparation going into training them. Like you said, Jonathan, we never want our volunteers to feel like they don't know what they're doing or they don't have the answer to a problem they may encounter when they're out at the polls. So this year, what we did, what we had done is we hosted three different training sessions, um, all within the evenings where we had, you know, some 300 join one night, 200 join another, 150 join another night. And we were able to show them everything they needed to know from um, election related law in California to county specifics, to scenarios they might encounter at the polls. And we did a scenario module practice run, which was really fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> we also taught them how to use all of our technology. We use different applications like JotForm. JotForm. Yeah. Explain what JotForm is because no one knows what JotForm I did not know what JotForm was as of two months ago. Oh my gosh. JotForm is this revolutionary application available both on the App Store and Google Play <laughs> <laughs> that you can use to fill out surveys in real time when you're at the polls. There are so many benefits to it. One of it is that we get to we get the data that our volunteers are implementing in real time as they're there at the polls filling out their their surveys and they report to us things like um, language accessibility, are there long lines, uh, voter intake forms if there's a problem at the polls, um, things like that, even just general observations from how accessible is the poll location. Are people, especially in this time of the pandemic, are people wearing masks? Are people following the COVID restrictions? Um, so all of this data is so important. And so applications like job form and paper forms that we also do offer are super useful for our volunteers. So we also take time to walk them through that so that they feel comfortable with every aspect of their time in the field. Um, so it ends up being a fun time. We get to ask questions, get to know our volunteers, especially in a time like this when we don't get to enjoy each other's presence in person. Having those two hours uh, can make a real big difference so that these volunteers can feel like they really are a part of something special because they are. Yeah, uh, and, and having run these programs in the past, we've always sent our volunteers into the field with a giant checklist on paper that they're sitting and trying to fill out on the palm of their hand while in these voting sites. And, JotForm is a way for them to do the same, but on a phone. Um, and hopefully that makes things easier and gets us data quicker um, and doesn't need months of data entry after election day, which is the bane of the existence of everyone who runs a poll monitoring program. Um, we'll see if it works, um, fingers crossed. Uh, Keanu, how do we choose where to send our volunteers? Yeah, so we look at a number of factors to kind of determine where the priority locations might be um, in our covered counties. And just to recap, we're going to be in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, and San Diego counties beginning this Saturday. Um, so we look at a number of things to help determine where within the county we're going to send our volunteers. Um, for this year, we're, we're looking at um, race, ethnicity, um, language preference, and we're also looking at past vote by mail participation. Because every voter this year is receiving a vote by mail ballot, um, and uh, looking at past vote by mail participation is an indicator of where we might expect the highest turnout at some of the in-person locations. So those are some of the things that we look at. Because we've had such a strong interest in our poll monitoring effort this year, we will be able to hit almost every single location across our five counties. So. Um, really grateful for our volunteers who have stepped up. Um, many of them are willing to travel great distances to be sure to give us the coverage that we need during the voting period. So what I'm hearing you say is that we're able to prioritize based on where the highest need is and we'll send people on Saturday and Monday to those high priority areas. But on Tuesday, we have so many folks volunteering with us, we can basically send folks to every single voting site in our five counties. Yeah, that's true. And some of our higher priority locations, we actually will able to hit twice within election day, once in the morning and once in the evening. Um, the morning is great because there's usually a morning rush and, and the locations are opening up for the day. 
the evening is equally important because 8 p.m. is the cutoff time for voting. And if there is a long line, we want to be there to, to kind of um, encourage people to stay in line because everyone who's in line by 8 p.m. does have the right to vote. Kiana, how do we group our sites? I mean, we, we send people to more than one site, right? Right. So our volunteers go out in three hour shifts. So we give them a batch of three locations that are within the same uh, proximity. And so our volunteers visit each location for about an hour. They record their observations. They report any issues to the command center and then they move on to the next location. So it's a little bit like a spot check, but we try to send them at higher priority times where we anticipate um, most issues will take place. And, and when we put people in urban sites that are in highly dense areas, it's easy to get three sites that are right next to each other. Some, some of our volunteers are gonna have three sites within 10 minutes of driving time total. Um, but it's just as important that we're assisting voters in rural communities. And so um, some of our volunteers are going out to um, the more rural areas, either north or east of the population centers. They have more drive time um, and, and we're extremely grateful that they're willing to do that. And Kiana mentioned that there's a couple sites that we won't be hitting I was doing some batching work, trying to pair, not pair, but whatever the equivalent of pairing, but with three is um, triplicating. I made up that word, um, voting sites. And um, and you would, I would find two, and then the next one would be an hour and a half or two hours away. And I'd be like, wait, what is going on there? And it would be one voting site on the California, Arizona border. And we just decided as important as it is to be everywhere, we can't ask people to traverse like Death Valley to get to a voting site. And so, there are some voting sites that are way, way out there that we won't be able to hit, but by and large, we're, we're just about everywhere on election day. Yeah, and I think it's also important to note that um, the social media monitoring program and the text thinking program that Sean mentioned, those are components of our election protection program. So even though we won't be in person at every single voting location, we are still reaching out to voters in all the counties, letting them know about their voting options and also having folks monitor their social media platforms across the state to look for myths and disinformation and get the right voting information out there. Right. Sean, you've been a poll monitor in the field before. What does it look like when a volunteer is actually at a voting site? Yeah, it's it's quite interesting. Uh, it, it depends on where you're poll monitoring. So um, I, I did a couple dozen sites in March and uh, depending on where I was, the experience oh, wait, was- a couple dozen sites? Yeah, because we, we began early voting, the uh, LA County began early voting 11 days in advance for the primary. So we had plenty of time to kind of go to various sites throughout that 11 day period and monitor. So um, that was, it was really boots on the ground uh, stuff. And there were some days where I just was like, I didn't come into the office. I just pull monitored all day long. So uh, it, it was interesting. And depending on where I was, I would see different issues. Uh, there will be a lot of times where you're gonna go to a poll, a poll site or a vote center, uh, which are called in some counties, where it's completely calm, uh, especially on early voting periods, maybe not so much this year, uh, because people are, are, are voting earlier uh, this year than uh, even in the March primaries, but uh, some are very calm and they may not be very busy. And you, uh, as a poll monitor, I'm kind of a fly on the wall, just observing, going through my checklist, uh, checking off uh, what is right, if there's anything wrong. Uh, and then I move on to the next one. However, there are some where there were like three hour lines. And so I would spend a, a little bit more time there uh, as well. And I would take uh, uh, more notes. Uh, there were a couple of times that I had to get on the phone to the command center, which uh, we have, we'll probably talk about in a bit for, for all of our poll monitors. And I had to call and say, look, there's a, there's a certain situation here. Uh, how do you suggest I handle it? And, and the people at our command center would walk me through what I should do. And if we couldn't resolve the problem that way, uh, the people at the command center would then escalate the, the issue to county and take care of it. So um, some of the things that I saw, people would ask me as a poll monitor, oh, can I just skip the line and drop off my mail-in ballot if it's filled out and drop it off in the drop box? There were other people who would ask me, this line is really long. Do you know, is there somewhere else I could go? So I'd pull up my phone and say, oh, you know what? There's like literally like less than a mile away. There's another site down the street and, um, you know, you might want to check that out. So those are the different things that uh, happen. I will say the poll workers at 99% of the places I went 
were very uh, nice and friendly uh, and they were very approachable. Um, but you'll run into issues, especially if like in LA County in March, they had a new program rolling out a new program with e-poll books. They had a lot of issues with those e-poll books, which I think they're going to fix this time around. So, but in general, very interesting, depends on where you're at, especially if you're in a high need area, you might see some more issues. How long is a poll worker in each voting site? I'm sorry? How long is each poll worker in each voting site? You mean a poll monitor or a poll worker? Sorry. Poll monitor. I yeah. Apologize. Poll, no, a, no. I, yeah. I, that's <laughs> an easy mistake to make, but one I thought I had gotten out of my system years ago. Yeah. Rookie that's my bad. Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I, I get the words confused, too, because it's very similar. But yeah, the, the poll worker is actually being uh, working at the polls, uh, being paid to be there. The poll monitors were the volunteers. And typically, the people on our shifts, we ask them to stay 45 to 50 minutes. Uh, unless there's issues, then they might have to stay a little bit longer to make sure they get resolved. But once they finish that 45, 50 minute period, they're moving on to their next uh, voting location. You know, Sean, you mentioned that in March, 99% of the poll workers were friendly and welcoming. Um, do poll workers ever push back on our poll monitors and tell them they don't have the right to be observing elections? I personally haven't experienced that, but it could happen in uh, certain cases. Now, the poll workers are trained, all supposed to be trained uh, within their counties on what uh, poll monitors' rights are. Uh, so, uh, there, but San Diego, for instance, is a little bit more strict on their guidelines for poll monitors. Uh, so, we just advise our poll monitors uh, if there's a situation in one of those counties, just be very mindful of the poll workers and their requests. And if you have any issues, you're going to call the command center and we're going to help you out. But in general, uh, most of the poll workers are trained very well, and they know that poll monitors are going to be there. Every once in a while, though, you will run into a poll worker who's either rude or just uh, not friendly or actually giving out incorrect information. And that's where we kind of step in and try, and try to, uh, you know, intervene. And if not, we, again, call the command center and find out what we need to do. You know, it helps. Um, I'm not sure uh, why this is, but it's my experience that poll workers are much more comfortable with poll monitors if the poll monitors are identified sort of visibly publicly in some way as a poll monitor, not just a random person who walks into, in street clothes, who walks into a voting site and says, here, I'm, I'm just here to watch things, which feels awkward. Um, but identifying the poll monitor as a poll monitor seems to help. Uh, how are we doing that this time around? Absolutely, yes. So two ways. Uh, we, we have all of our poll monitors will have either a button or a badge that identifies them as a nonpartisan uh, election protection poll, poll monitor. So they have that on. But then they also, we have trained all of our poll monitors. The first thing that they should do when they get to a site is to go in, introduce themselves to the poll workers and let them know who they are uh, right away and that they're just going to be there for 45, 50 minutes observing. Uh, and that pretty much, uh, you know, ameliorates any any issues that uh, a poll worker could have about who is this person and why are they here. So we, uh, our, our poll monitors are trained in that, that, that sense. I left because I thought I had an old poll monitor button in a box next to my desk, but I, I don't have it. I can't find it. I'm frustrated with myself. Um, but big, huge credit to Alvin Valverde, who is a member of our team, who sent maybe 800 buttons to people because he sent one to every single one of our poll monitors, plus like 200 people who signed up but never got trained. So now they have a complimentary button from California Common Cause that they won't actually be using. Um, uh, but I mean, the amount of work it takes to send out gloves, masks, and buttons to 800 people in individual envelopes um, is just incredible. We spent, I think, like 600 plus dollars on stamps alone uh, and infinite hours of Alvin's time. So much love to, to the work that has to go into uh, uh, this work, this, this project. Um, okay, uh, I wanna ask what happens, this is a question for Kiana, what happens when a volunteer in the field identifies a problem and needs help us uh, resolving it? Yeah, so our volunteers are trained to call the command center um, to report any issues, or maybe they have a question about something that, that's happening and they want to know whether, um, whether it's a problem or not. So um, the command center is where uh, the Common Cause staff, all the faces you see today, are going to be based during the voting period, 
We're gonna be there full time, um, ready to hear from our volunteers about any potential issues. And so we have a centralized space where we're um, collecting reports from our poll monitors. And within that same hub, we have several staff members who are designated to call county elections officials and let them know about what our volunteers are hearing on the ground. Um, so once we hear from our volunteers, our next call is directly to the county to let them know about what we're hearing. Um, we follow up with the county to make sure that the issue was addressed and we track the status of the issue. Um, and we also keep our partners in the loop. Some of our partners are also on the ground and are um, interested in tracking issues or are equally reporting issues that they're hearing from the ground. And so we're in touch with them and um, are really focused on making sure that counties know about what's happening on the ground in case they don't already and that those issues are quickly addressed. You know, Kiana, if um, a problem arises at a voting location operated by the county, um, I think some people might ask, is the county elections office really the right entity to resolve that problem? Um, how can we count that the, uh, how can we be assured that the county elections officials are on the right side on these issues? What's been your experience with that? Um, I would say our county elections officials in California are great. Um, they're very proactive about issues. They really care about the voter experience and um, they're usually very quick to respond if any issues come up, um, whether it's a big issue or a small issue that's impacting an individual voter. My experience is that the, the county is incredibly responsive to this. So um, that's why we reach out to counties before our election protection program to let them know that our volunteers are going to be in the field, that our command center is going to be sharing reports with them. And so we open up that line of communication well before election day. Um, and if an issue does pop up, we have a direct line to, to contact them and let them know about this. Um, I, I'll just share that when running poll monitoring programs in Northern California, we've had instances in which uh, for example, a, a voting site runs out of translated ballots um, and we call the county elections office immediately and their response is, we're going to drive more out right now. We'll call you back when the issue has been resolved and within 20 to 30 minutes, they've been able to address the issue. Or we call county elections office, even in some um, counties where you'd expect uh, maybe less um, uh, the reputation of the county and its politics might suggest that they're going to be less voter friendly and we'll call in a problem saying poll workers are asking every voter for identification in violation of state law and they will call the count they'll call the polling place immediately and tell them hey knock it off that's not what you're supposed to do you weren't trained to do that etc um, and so i will say that you know our our, our elections officials um, listen it's a big and diverse field and you've got people with different attitudes and different perspectives but by and large um, they're, they're fairly quick to resolve issues. And if they don't resolve issues, we have backups. Um, we, we can call the, the state attorney general, we can call the secretary of state, and we can call the ACLU, who are our litigation partners. In the event that there's a problem that requires court action, the ACLU has already drafted all the relevant court documents and have them sort of at the ready. Um, so, uh, by the way, Kiani, people may be confused how we're operating a headquarters in the time of social distancing. Are we really going to be in person together? Um, we are this year. We felt it was really important to be ready to uh, answer our volunteers' questions and also have a centralized space to discuss about the issues that are coming up. So we have been very, very cautious about um, our employees' health. And so everyone is getting tested before joining the command center. It's, it's still a pretty small group but we're all getting tested and we all have safety measures um, within the building to, um, to make sure that we're all safe and healthy, so. When I've run EP headquarters in the past, the, you have, let's say you have six phones um, at six desks at 7 a.m. on election day, every single one of those phones starts ringing and they ring off the hook for an hour or more because there's so many issues that people encounter right off the bat when polls open. Um, and it's just kind of impossible to handle that remotely. Um, it, it's really, really challenging. Um, and so you need like a critical mass of human beings in one space. And so we're doing what we can to be COVID safe while actually creating that, while also simultaneously creating that critical mass. Um, so our work doesn't really end on election day. Alex, I wanna ask you, right? We're collecting an enormous volume of data from our volunteers who are using JotForm, uh, the aforementioned JotForm. What do we do with all that data? Why are we collecting it? Well, you know, there's so much that we can do. 
right. I'm just kidding. Um, so let's there, and there is for the record. <laughs> there's, there's a lot we could do. Um, so let's say you're a pole monitor. You went out into the field. You brought your jot form app with you or your paper. You filled everything out. You know, you, you, you just give a round of applause. Good job. Oh my gosh. It's just so amazing heroes of the election truly truly and you're like where is this all going to now it goes to our willy wonka-esque you know batch of information um but we don't do it with our imagination we do it with the hard work that all of our volunteers put into it that's why it runs so well so and spreadsheets the and hard work of our volunteers and spreadsheets and spreadsheets um, Kiana is actually um, the queen of spreadsheets, as Sean can also attest to. We bow in her presence. She's incredible. So <laughs> once we have all this data, there's so much we can do with it. One of the main things that we can do is we can send to the counties, hey, this is what happened, and this has happened consistently, so maybe do better. Um, but we can also propose solutions for different issues that our volunteers maybe ran into more than others. Maybe we saw a lot of problems with language accessibility. We can bring those up, and those can actually affect county policies so that later on in future elections, they're that much more efficient. So the work that these volunteers are doing, the data they're collecting, has some real-world impacts that can impact elections to come so it doesn't just go in a, a drawer and we just lock the key and forget about it quite the opposite we can do so much with it totally right totally right Tiana you should tell friends and family that you've been bestowed with the title of queen of the spreadsheets which it's is not a title I wanted but I guess I earned it this year <laughs> it is it is actually totally 100% legit and a very awesome title as nerdy as it may sound um, okay, thank you all of you for sharing about this work. It's critically important. I'm proud of this entire team for how much effort they put into this. I know it's been a lot of strain and a lot of late nights and we're just um, just around the corner from, uh, from, from seeing it through. So um, I wanna speak to the folks listening. Um, hopefully you have your ballot by now. Let's talk about how you can, you can vote that ballot. Well, first, if you have not received your ballot, call your county elections office ASAP to inquire as to what's going on. They will almost certainly direct you at this point, this close to the election, to use in-person voting, either early voting or on election day. It's going to be tight getting you a replacement vote by mail ballot. Though in California, we do have something called remote accessible vote by mail, which means you can get emailed a ballot, you print it out at home, you vote it at home, and then you mail it back into your elections office. They then recreate it on a ballot at the elections office if you want it through their system. That requires you to have a printer, which very few people have at this point, but um, you can always ask for a remote accessible vote by mail if you call your county elections office. If you haven't registered to vote, or if you've moved recently and haven't updated your registration, please, same thing, use in-person voting, either early voting or on election day. In California, under new law, you can register to vote and vote at the same time in every single voting site in the state. If you're still holding on to that vote by mail ballot, uh, I'm seeing a lot of calls on the internet for dropping your ballot off at a drop box or walking it into a voting site because a lot of people don't trust USPS or think that their ballot is going to take too long to get delivered. This is particularly true in states where irrationally they require your vote by mail ballot to not be postmarked by election day, but actually received by the elections office by election day. And people are afraid that if you put your ballot in the mail now, six days before election day, or five or four days before lunch day. It's not gonna arrive on time. So the drop boxes and walking your ballot into a voting site are both very legitimate options, but also please US, use USPS if it's your best option. In California, mail delivery, now mail delivery may be delayed, though there's very little evidence. There's evidence to the contrary on California. Things seem to be running okay. But in California, your ballot can arrive up to 17 days after election day and still be counted as long as it is postmarked by election day or on election day. So feel free to use USPS, your ballot will be counted. I used USPS to drop off my ballot and it was delivered within one day. If you're voting in person, please think about your early voting options. All counties or almost all counties are offering voting opportunities available before election day, including, and especially this weekend, we want you to avoid long lines and crowds by casting your ballot early. And if you have any problems, call the National Voter Hotline for help, 866 our vote. Put that number in your phone, write it on your arm, do something, 866-OUR-VOTE um, to access help when casting your ballot. Thanks all of you for joining us today uh, for the last uh, live stream of election season. 
Alex, Kiana, Sean, I want to thank you for joining us today and for the work that you're doing. Who knows what our plan is for this live stream next week? It will be the day after election day, and we will either be in a beach or in bed or something, but maybe I'll drag myself to a camera and we can talk about how things went, or maybe I'll drag these three in front of a camera against their wishes. Um, probably not. I don't know. Anyway, um, follow us uh, on our social media for updates about um, the home stretch of the election and also, most importantly, what's happening with next week's show. Uh, we're on Twitter at Common Cause CA. I'm on Twitter at underscore Jonathan Stein. We're also on Instagram and at CA Common Cause. As always, we appreciate you and your support of California Common Cause. Thank you for being with us in this fight. Please stay safe and happy voting.